Welcome. In this video, we are going to go over what critical thinking is, why critical thinking matters, what the correspondence theory of truth is, what an argument is and its component parts, namely premises and conclusions, what the difference is between an explanation versus a justification, how to identify an argument, and what implicit premises are. So let us get started. What is critical thinking? Well, for our purposes, critical thinking is merely the systematic evaluation of statements and beliefs by using principles and procedures in uh, logic. So why does critical thinking matter? Critical thinking matters because frankly, there's just a lot of bullshit out there in the world. So by understanding and implementing tools in critical thinking, you'll be in a better position to identify and try to avoid any bullshit out there in the world. Another reason why critical thinking matters is because critical thinking provides us with the essential tools that we need in order to understand the world around us. And finally, critical, critical thinking matters because critical thinking allows us or helps us assess our own beliefs. Frankly, many of the beliefs that you and I both hold right now, uh, some of them are true and some of them are false. So what we want to do is try to identify those false beliefs so that we can do away with them in order to only keep those beliefs that are true. And critical thinking helps us accomplish that. So why do we want to have true beliefs? The reason we want to have true beliefs is because having true beliefs puts us in a better position to know more about ourselves and more about the world around us. And the more we know about ourselves and the world around us, the better position we are in in order to accomplish the goals we set out for yourself. So kind of just think about it this way. If you walk around the world only believing things that are false, you are going to be less likely to accomplish the goals that you set for yourself because you're always going to have false information. So you want to have true information and this true information will better situate you to be successful in accomplishing the goals you set out for yourself. Okay, so in this course, we are going to be assuming what is known as the correspondence theory of truth. Now, there are many uh, theories of truth out there, but we're going to be assuming this one. So if you want to know more about other theories of truth, uh, truth, and especially the correspondence theory of truth, I direct you to please read the article Truth as Correspondence and also watch the video Pursuing the Truth. So what is the correspondence theory of truth? Simply put, the correspondence theory of truth is a theory that maintains that statements, any statement, is going to be true under the conditions that the statement correctly or accurately represents the way the world is. If the statement does not correctly or accurately represent the way the world is, then the statement turns out to be false. So consider the following example. Take the statement, Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister of Canada. Well. This statement is true under the conditions that the person, Justin Trudeau, in fact is the Prime Minister of Canada. If somebody else were the Prime Minister of Canada, let's just say Donald Trump, then the statement, Justin Trudeau is the Prime Minister of Canada, would turn out to be false because it's not accurately or correctly representing the way the world really is. That's all the correspondence theory of truth is. It's just a theory that maintains that truth is a matter of whether statements or beliefs correctly or accurately represent the way the world is. So here are some consequences that follow if in fact the correspondence theory of truth turns out to be, well, true. If the correspondence theory of truth is the correct theory of truth, then this means that statements cannot be partially true or false. In other words, According to the correspondence theory of truth, every statement is either true or false. There's no in between or there's no degree of truth or falsity. In addition to that, merely believing or thinking something doesn't make it true. So for example, uh, there are many beliefs that we have that are in fact false, but just because you believe something, it doesn't mean that it's true. What makes a statement or a belief true is going to be the way the world really is, not what we think the way the world is or feel the way the world is. And finally, if the correspondence theory of truth is correct, then the notion of a relative truth, or in other words, things like, well, that's true for me, but not true for you, uh, that doesn't make sense, right? 
Why? Because according to the correspondence theory of truth, every statement is going to be true if it represents the way the world is. And so if it represents the way the world is, then it doesn't make sense for us to say that some statements are only going to be true for a small group of people in that world and not for others. Right? So these are some consequences of the correspondence theory of truth. And again, I please direct you to watch the video Pursuing the Truth and also to read the article Truth as Correspondence to get a better idea of this. Okay, what are arguments? Arguments are just a collection of statements. So think of collections the same way you think of, you know, your collection of shoes, your collection of, I don't know, video games, right? These are just groups of things. Well, arguments are groups of things as well. They're just groups of statements. Now, what makes an argument an argument as opposed to any other group of statements is that in an argument, we always have what is known as a conclusion. This is the thing that a speaker or an author wants you to believe. And then we also have premises. Premises are the reasons or the justification for why you should believe the conclusion. So here I want to make a distinction between a justification and an explanation. A justification is a reason for why you should come to believe something. An explanation just tells us why something is the case. So premises are not explanations of conclusions. Premises are justifications for why we should believe conclusions. To know more about the difference between justifications and explanations, I please direct you to watch the video uh, titled Justifications versus Explanations. Okay, so what are statements? Well, statements are sentences, but they're a particular type of sentence. They're a, they're a, they are sentences that can either be true or false. So here are examples of statements. Now, note one thing. We may not know whether a statement is true or false, but that doesn't make it a non-statement. So for example, some of you guys may know that Montreal is in Quebec. Some of you guys may not know that Montreal is in Quebec. Whether you know that Montreal is in Quebec or not is irrelevant for whether this in fact is a statement. We know that this is a statement because it has the grammatical structure that allows it to be evaluated for truth or falsity. Um, here are examples, contrast these with non-statements. So sentences like, close the door, can you give me a beer? Watch out for the bear. These sentences are not statements because these sentences cannot be true or false. A question cannot be true or false. So statements or these types of sentences, these can be component parts of arguments, whereas things like questions or warnings, these types of sentences cannot be component parts of arguments. Arguments are only composed of statements. In other words, arguments are only composed of declarative sentences that can be true or false. So how do we identify arguments out in the real world? Well, when we come across arguments in the real world, we're always going to come across them either in the form of a text, either a magazine, a newspaper, a book, or through conversation, dialogue. What you want to do to determine whether you are dealing with an argument or not is to see if you have a sense of the author or the speaker trying to convince you of something. If, they are, if you feel that they're trying to convince you of something, then most likely you are dealing with an argument. If you don't feel like they are trying to convince you of something, then you're not dealing with an argument. Now, if you're reading something or you're in a dialogue with somebody and you feel like the speaker or author is trying to convince you of something, then you are more li mo most likely dealing with an argument. Your next question should be, what is it that they are trying to convince me of? Well, the thing that the author or speaker is trying to convince you of, that thing is going to be the conclusion, right? So once you've identified the conclusion of the argument, your next step is to identify the reasons or the justifications for why you should come to believe what the speaker or the author wants you to believe. So let's try this out. Here are two pieces of text. What I want you to do is take a few moments um, and I want you to tell me, see which of these is an argument and which is not an argument. Is A an argument or not? Is B an argument or not? 
If you identify one of these as an argument, then tell me what's the conclusion. And once you've identified the conclusion, then what are the premises? So at this moment, please pause the video and see if you can identify which of these is an argument and which is not. And also in the argument, which are the premises and which is the conclusion. So take okay, welcome back. If you identify B as the argument and A as the non-argument, then you are correct. So let's take a look at this. Why is B the argument? Well, B is an argument because when reading this, you get the sense that the author wants you to believe something. And not only do they want you to believe something, they are providing you with reasons for why to believe it. So what is it that the author wants you to believe? Well, the author wants you to believe this, that poverty offers numerous benefits to the non-poor. That is the conclusion. That is what the author wants you to believe. The rest of the text are the premises. Here are the reasons or justifications for why you should come to believe this conclusion. Now let's look at A. A is not an argument. Why? Because A, while a collection of statements, all of these can be true or false, none of these statements is identified as a conclusion. In other words, it doesn't seem like the author wants you to necessarily believe any of these things because they don't provide reasons or justification for why you should believe them. The author is merely just reporting on their vacation and their desire to go back to Paris relatively soon. Okay, now in the real world, not every argument that we come across uh, comes with all of the required premises that we need to assess the argument. Sometimes there is key information that is missing. This key information is what is known as an implicit premise. So an implicit premise is just a key statement that is not included in the argument, but is essential or required in order to make sense of the argument. So consider the following argument. Any senator who is caught misusing campaign funds should resign. Therefore, Senator Bob must resign. What I want you to do here is pause the video and tell me what is the implicit premise that is missing? In other words, what's the key information that is missing in order to go from this information here to the conclusion? Why should we believe this based on this and if there's some information missing? So take a few minutes. Okay, what was missing here is the, the statement that Senator Bob misused campaign funds. Now, here in our answer, you notice that the argument looks a bit different than the previous argument. Uh, the argument as we presented here is what is known as a standard argument form. The reason we call this a standard argument form is because we take this argument and we identify each premise, including the missing premise here and the implicit premise and the conclusion in this kind of linear or column way. And it just makes it easier for the eyes. It makes it easier for us to assess the argument. So when you see an argument that looks like this, where we have P1 and then some text, P2 and then some text, and then a line conclusion, this is what is known as a standard argument form. So in this standard argument form, we have the initial piece of information provided to us by the text that any senator who is caught misusing campaign funds should resign. We also have the statement uh, Senator Bob must resign, which is the conclusion. What was missing is this key statement, this key piece of information that allows us to make better sense of the argument, namely the implicit premise, which we identified here. And this is the premise that states Senator Bob misused campaign funds. So now if we read this out loud, the argument makes more sense. Any senator who is caught misusing campaign funds should resign. Senator Bob misused campaign funds, therefore Senator Bob must resign. In order to make uh, to get a better sense of what implicit premises are, I direct you to please watch the video titled Implicit Premises. Okay, in this video, we went over what critical thinking was, why critical thinking matters, what the correspondence theory of truth is, what arguments are and its component parts, premises and conclusions, the difference between an explanation and a justification, and what implicit premises are.